Today is the second Sunday after Pentecost, and um, I am doing my sermon from our chapel in our little room here. Um, on the way to Mass today, the tire fell off of our vehicle, and so we, I was not able to make it there. So I thought I'd go ahead and try to videotape my sermon here in this little chapel. Um, we're in a new home as well. Uh, we call it our house of prayer. And we have the garage right behind this wall here. Fits about 20, 25 people. And um, it won't be long before we're going to start getting it ready um, to have a regular chapel instead of just this small room. So you can keep that in your prayers that we have enough finances to take care of it and get it get it ready. We've got a lot of things happening. Quite a few baptisms um, are are coming up. And so um keep me in your prayers. But today's sermon is called When a Blessing Becomes a Curse. In Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 24, we read, But he said to him, a certain man made a great supper and invited many. And he sent a servant at the hour of supper to say to them that were invited that they should come, for now all things are ready. And they began all at once to make excuse. The first said to him, I have bought a farm, and I must needs go out and see it. I pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to try them. I pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And the servant returning told these things to his Lord. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. And bring in hither the poor and the feeble and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. But I say unto you that none of those men that were invited shall taste of my supper. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As I was studying for my sermon, I began to see a theme. And that theme became the title for today's sermon, which is, When a Blessing Becomes a Curse. Our gospel reading today begins with this one word, but. It's an odd word to begin a, uh, a reading with. But, he said to him, why, why the word but? And, and who was him that Jesus was talking to? So I looked at the text surrounding the gospel reading for today, and it turns out that Jesus was at a dinner hosted by a Pharisee, and Jesus was talking about humility. Because as he watched those at the dinner, he was seeing just the opposite in the others, invited at the same dinner. And all of a sudden, one of those listening to Jesus talking about humility, he pops up with this pious pronouncement. He says, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Well, this is a good statement. It was a wonderful state, statement in and of itself. But who would argue with the idea that eating bread in the kingdom of God is a good thing. It, it's better than the thought of being in hell, crying out for mercy, asking for someone to dip the tip of their finger in water and cool the one in hell's tongue because he was tormented in the flames. It is this pious outburst that Jesus responds to. And Luke begins a description of the response with these words. But he said to him. 
Jesus' answer to the man's comment was the parable in our gospel reading of the dinner to which no one seemed to want to come. They all had their reasons. One had to inspect some newly purchased real estate and another had to try out some new John Deere tractor, which in those days were five yoke of oxen. And the third had just gotten married. The day of the big dinner comes and no one wants to take the time to take part in it. Of course, it, it struck me that the reasons they were skipping out on the banquet were all the abundance of the blessings given by God. James chapter 1 verse 17 says that every best gift, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father, the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of alter, alteration. Was there anything wrong with owning land? No. God from the very beginning called the dry land earth and saw that it was good. He told man to have dominion over the whole earth. Was there anything wrong with owning five yoke of oxen? No. God said in Genesis chapter 1, Let the earth bring forth cattle after its kind. And he saw that it was good. Was there anything wrong with being married? Now think real hard before you say anything. No, God, God said that he looked on Adam and Eve and said, increase and multiply and fill the earth. And then God looked upon it all, including Adam and Eve, and said, it was all very good. The problem was not the good that God had blessed them with. The problem was they were too successful. They were too rich. They were too happy to take time for the dinner that was prepared for them. They, like in the days of Noah, were, too, were just too busy and wrapped up with the good things God blessed them with on this earth. They had no time for the God who had given them the blessings. And so as Malachi chapter 2 verse 2 says, because they would not hear God's voice and because they have not laid it to heart, quote, I will curse your blessings. Yea, I will curse them, unquote. In Israel, at the time of Jesus, no one had to even guess what the parable was about. The host of the dinner is God. The dinner is described in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, as the heavenly wedding supper of the groom, Jesus. It was made all the more clear by this being spoken in response to someone talking about the blessedness of eating bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus was telling the man who spoke so boldly about the blessedness of being a part of the feast in heaven that none of them were going. This wasn't the none in the absolute sense that no Jew is going to go to heaven, but the none of very few and probably none of those present at the meal because the nation of Israel as a race had turned away from God and Jesus was judging them for having taken the rich and abundant blessings of God in their lives as the excuse to forget God and reject his invitations. Those who would not be a part of the dinner were those having received the blessing of God and accepted the blessings he bestowed. That when he came and invited them to the feast, they preferred the blessings over whatever it was that God was offering them. The blessings that God had given them had become a curse to them for ignoring God. Again, it says, I will curse your blessings. Yea, I will curse them. So what about us? 
understand that the same invitation to the dinner has come to us. Many of us as Christians have found that we are quite comfortable with our lives here on earth. There are things in our life that they would rather pursue than being in communion with God, our Father. There are too many blessings in the world to be enjoyed, to take time to attend the banquet of the one who gave us all those blessings. There is too much wealth, too many toys, too much we could be doing instead to take the time to hear and accept the invitation of the Lord. Some leave the table because they did not have the commitment they understood that being a Christian required. They did not count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Others don't really say why they leave the table. Others wanted their old friends back more than they wanted the seat at the banquet. Some have allowed the blessing of having a family to get in the way of being at the table. Their family, their blessing, has become a curse. They put their family ahead of God. And that's what it means when just a few verses down from our gospel readings, it says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Sometimes it is not easy putting God before your family. But Luke goes on to say, And whosoever doth not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. See, when we walk away from God in faith and commitment for the same reasons as the men in, in the parable, do you imagine that we do not fall under the same judgment of God? The possibilities exist for every one of us to get so wrapped up in our blessings that we do not realize that we actually stepped away from the table. Think of the man Demas. He was a fellow worker with the Apostle Paul. He is mentioned three times by Paul. First in Colossians, where Paul includes Demas among those sending greetings to the Colossians. Then, in Philemon, where Demas is also among the workers who send their greetings. And finally, in 2 Timothy, where Paul writes, For Demas, having loved this present world, has forsaken me and gone to Thessalonica. If it could happen to Demas, who works side by side with Paul, None of us is immune. So we need to exercise care. We need to examine ourselves to see what kind of a grasp we have on the blessings on earth. We need to consider the possibility that there are things that threaten us by being too attractive or too important or too demanding in our lives or in our minds as well. Nothing is worth the loss of this one thing. For what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul? Or, or what shall a man give for his soul? We have Christ and all his blessings by grace through faith. We receive him through his word preached and receive him through the sacrament of his body and his blood. But how easy it is to begin to depend on and place our trust in our own resources, our doctors, our health and strength, our, our income, our, our own dreams and ambitions for our lives, or, or what is left of our lives. Thousands of former Christians who do not put their trust in Jesus Christ and no longer believe are unaware of it. 
they remember believing. They don't feel any different. They seamlessly make the transition from genuine faith to something else without realizing it until it's too late. The man who could not come to the dinner because he bought land did not say he did not want to come. He was just busy. He got distracted and had a schedule conflict and had to make a choice. And some of the people who leave the table left for a flashier table that was more exotic looking. When they leave to escape the church, to avoid the word that is clearly preached and to run from their baptismal promises to renounce Satan, his works, and all the things he has to offer, that suggests that they got distracted, lost sight of what was going on, and made choices that placed the priority of the invitation to the great dinner behind the, the business or the pleasures of life and importance. It was like sending a note, please consider me excused. Have you done that? I hope not. But it seems appropriate to do an examination of conscience and to look and see if there is anything that might be distracting you or something that is rising up to take the place in your heart which only Christ and the gospel of forgiveness, life, and salvation should hold. Forewarned is forearmed, they say. God uses the preaching of his word and the gifts he gives in the sacraments to help us keep him first at all times. You make choices every day. Some turn you toward the faith and toward deep and depending completely on God. And some tend to lead you away. You want to consider what the things you do and the choices you make mean and where they may lead you and endeavor to be deliberately and faithfully alive. Endeavor to be deliberately and faithfully living out the Christian life by God's grace. Let us be acutely aware of our need for his guidance and strength and, and blessing. Do not allow the blessings in our lives to become a curse. All the good things, all the blessings that are in our lives ultimately come from God. And so use them to draw you and others in a closer relationship with Jesus. Otherwise, God will curse your blessings and you will find yourself as those in the parable. None of those men that were invited shall taste of my supper. God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.